to Luke 7, starting at verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was ill and about to die. The centurion heard Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have to come, have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large group went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier. They were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Maybe on days like this, particularly if we feel somehow caught up in that attack last night, it's a familiar place to us close to us. Many of us have walked across that bridge many times. Many of us have drunk in the various pubs south of the river. I used to have an office just uh, very near where the shooting happened. And on days like this, we feel perhaps more keenly a a need to be saved. But really, we should feel that need all the time. Because we need salvation from more than terror or danger or distress. We need saving from all the consequences of living in a broken, fallen world. Sometimes those consequences burst out in tragedy, in illness, in devastation, in earthquakes, in famines. Sometimes they burst out in wars. Sometimes they burst out in terror attacks and hatred spewing out on our streets. Sometimes that happens, but always we're living in a broken, fallen, tragic world that is messed up, and we're messed up too. And we need a saviour from that. And we're not going to find one anywhere else. But in Jesus, revealed through his word, the Bible. And we're strongly reminded on days like this to preach the gospel to ourselves. Where will we find comfort and security and hope? Where will we find it? It's in Jesus. And we need to preach the gospel to our world. Where will they find hope, comfort, satisfaction, security? The only source is in Jesus. So we're preaching the gospel again this morning. This section is all about salvation. It's all about being saved. You probably know that uh, in the Greek, the word for healing, for saving, for rescuing, it's all the the same word, family. So when, when Luke uses the word heal, he's often using a word that could be used for save. And he's thinking often in his gospel about salvation, Jesus the Savior, and illustrating how he is that Savior. And Luke often uses the healings as a sign that Jesus is 
the ultimate saviour, the ultimate rescuer. Really, any of the miracles that any of the Gospels record are remarkable, aren't they? But this one, these two, sorry, seem remarkable as Jesus commands and speaks from a distance and he speaks to death. It's an old quote now, but it's a good one. The, uh, the film director and actor Woody Allen once said this, I don't want to become immortal through my work. I want to become immortal through not dying. And here we have one young man on the verge of death and another who's crossed over that threshold being buried. And Jesus... Saves them both. Salvation isn't getting over some tragedy. Salvation isn't making amends. Salvation isn't feeling safe and secure and comforted. Salvation is Jesus breaking in and overcoming what condemns and destroys. And Luke wants to show us that. And we're going to look at that this morning. Two astonishing things. First of all, uh, astonishing faith from the first 10 verses, astonishing faith. We start with someone at the top of the tree, as it were, and then in the second miracle, we look at someone kind of at the bottom of the tree of society. So starting at the top, this astonishing faith in the first 10 verses. He's rich, he's powerful, he's a centurion, he's in command of maybe 100, but there's some debate about whether it's actually 80 soldiers that a centurion's in charge of, but in charge of a big group of men He could have been a Roman, but most likely he was another nationality uh, that was stationed in uh, that part of Palestine. Maybe he was part of Herod's governing army. But whatever his nationality, he's acting on behalf of the Roman occupiers. They were occupying Israel at this time. They were the controlling government. There, There were governors appointed over various regions, like Herod and like Pilate. Uh, but the ultimate rulers were the Romans. And so these centurions, as well as being serving soldiers, they acted as kind of local magistrates, kind of local policemen, sometimes those who executed judgment. Often they were wealthy, often they were resented, but this one, it seems, was liked and respected by the local Jewish people. And his highly valued servant is dying. He's not just a bit ill, he's seriously ill and he's dying. And the man hears about Jesus and, not perhaps sure what the protocol is, he sends some Jews. Obviously he's a respected person because they're willing to go for him. And Jesus decides to go and help. And the centurion ponders it on a little bit further as Jesus is on his way to come to the man's house and he reflects again. And then he says something quite remarkable in verses uh, 6 through to 8. What does he say? Have a look. Second part of verse 6. Lord, he's addressing Jesus. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and this one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And Jesus is astonished at these words. Such humility. Lord, don't trouble yourself. I didn't even think I was worthy to come to you. I didn't think when I thought about it further that I even deserved you to come into my house. I'm rich, I'm powerful, I represent the might of the Roman Empire, but I'm not worthy. I don't deserve you coming to see me. Such humility. But at the same time, such amazing confidence. You see how he goes on to say, I recognise your authority, but 
But you know that gives me confidence. I don't feel worthy of you, but it gives me great confidence because I see that you're in authority like I'm in authority. I've got soldiers, I tell them to go out to the battlefield and they go. I've got servants, I say, come and just clean my shoes and they do it. And I can see you, Jesus, from all I've heard about you, I can see you're like that. But, but not just with a few soldiers and a few servants. You're like that with the universe with sickness, with disease, with all the consequences of living in a broken world. You're that kind of a Lord. Such humility, such confidence. So much so that Jesus is amazed. You know, normally Jesus is amazed at unbelief, isn't he? He's, he's, he's astonished that, that these, these miracles happen and, and the Jews still don't believe. But here, his astonishment is at the faith of this man. He says, I haven't seen anything like this in, in Israel. See that in verse 9. I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. With the guys who ought to recognise me, have all that background, all the evidence. But this centurion, Gentile, non-Jewish person, he's got amazing faith. And the man returns, or the group returns, and the man's servant is healed. It's a miracle. From a distance... Jesus speaks, the man's healed. Do you remember the godly Simeon in the temple? Just a few pages back, Luke 2 and verse 32. The baby Jesus is presented at the temple and Simeon, verse 28, took the baby in his arms and praised God. And as he ends that time of praise, verse 32, he says this, You've sent... Uh, your servant, and then verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Here's a Gentile ruler. He sees the light, doesn't he? Here's this baby, grown up, spreading light to his Roman rulers, occupiers. Lights truly come to the Gentiles as he humbly expresses his faith. I can't remember what bullet points I've got. There we go, that's it. And it raises a question, a question for you. What about your humility? What about your confidence? It's really simple. What this story says to you this morning is, are you humble enough to recognise you're not worthy of God's love, God's care, God's compassion, God's kindness, God's provision. Sometimes, maybe all the time, before we're really confronted with the, the bare truth, we think somehow we deserve it. Somehow we deserve God to do something for us, to think that somehow God owes us a favour, particularly if we've done a bit of religious stuff, particularly if we've done something good, we feel like God owes us. And here's a good man living in Israel. He's a good man. He helped build the synagogue with his money. He's seemingly a religious man because he recognises who Jesus is. But this good man realises all his great acts are just like filthy rags. And it's the best, best position for you to get into when you say, Lord, I'm not worthy that you even come into my house. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy. I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your compassion. I don't deserve anything from you. In fact, I deserve your judgment because I live my life in rebellion against you. I don't want to serve you. I don't want to love you. I don't want to obey you. I just want to serve myself and other lords. And it's such a great step when we realise we're not worthy. This centurion undoubtedly had a greatly decorated house. I'm sure he had really decent china. I'm sure the paint wasn't peeling off the walls. But he says, I'm not worthy that you come into my house. And we might look pretty good on the outside. And people might think, he or she, definitely, they definitely deserve God's mercy. 
but none of us do. And it's great when we realise that. Do you follow the centurion in his humility? But do you follow the centurion in his confidence? You see, it's a great place to be bowed down low and say, I'm not worthy, Lord, of your mercy. But, but then to look up and say, but I'm confident that you're going to show it to me because you are great and you are gracious. And to look up like the centurion with confidence and say, I don't just believe you're compassionate, I believe you're powerful. I believe you have authority. I don't just look to you as someone who might be nice to me, but I look to you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the supreme ruler over the universe. I look to you as the one who's in authority, who can say the word, and it happens. And when it comes to me and my salvation, all you need to do is grant me forgiveness, and it's granted. Do you have the centurion's humility? Do you have the centurion's confidence? Maybe you need to say for the first time to to Jesus this morning, just say the word. Just say the word. Have mercy. Just say the word. You have the authority. You have the power. You have the character to forgive me, to save me, to rescue me. Just say the word, Lord. Will you do that to Jesus this morning? Ask him to heal you. Astonishing faith and secondly, astonishing grace. Verses 11 through 17. Part of the authenticity of the Gospels is that each have their own unique stories and Luke has one of them here with a kind of obscure place uh, that people like to worry about, where it is and what it is. Uh, But it's a small town called Nain. A friend of mine uh, has a a relative who's seriously ill. And uh, the undertaker came to visit because this person is terminally ill and they're making preparations. And uh, someone from the undertaker came in to the house and uh, sat down with one of the relatives of the person who's seriously ill and and said, we're going to have some fun. He actually said that, an undertaker, in the house of someone who's dying. We're going to have some fun. And apparently, he went away and did some other arrangement, came back, and he said the same thing again. I don't know whether it was like a, a nervous reflex that he has. Funerals are not fun at all, are they? But amazingly, if he'd have said it about this funeral, he'd have kind of been right, wouldn't he? There's no fun at first in this procession. People can try and make funerals jolly. They can try and say, dress up wearing something bright and all those things. But ultimately, funerals always bear sadness. It's bearing down on the funeral, especially the funeral of a child. You can imagine all those individual stories of uh, particularly the children that were killed in the Manchester bombings and Others uh, who were killed yesterday and the scenes of, of their funerals, very sad affairs. And two facts here make uh, the scene even more tragic. The lady is a widow and she loses her young son. He's described as a young man later by Jesus. But not only is he her son, he's her only son. So there's no family left to help. There's no debate going on in Israel about whether the the tax threshold should be this or this and whether social care comes in at this level and stops at this level. There's no politicking going on about it. There just isn't any welfare state at all. So you lose your husband, you lose your children, there is no one to provide for you. It's just left to the mercy of your fellow countrymen. So it was a serious thing for her, both practically as well as emotionally. And Jesus, in verse 13, shows something of the character, the character that he often displayed and the character that we need to display, seeing any tragedy at any funeral. 
It doesn't matter whether we're directly involved in that funeral. When, we, when we're involved in a funeral of anyone, we should weep with those who weep. When we hear the news about the London Bridge attack last night, we, we, we mourn with those who mourn. We feel the fear of those who fear. We show compassion. What does Jesus do, verse 13? When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Jesus never gives a cold theological explanation to someone in grief, does he? Your son died because of the effects of the fall. No, his heart goes out to her. Now we can't resurrect people as Jesus is about to, but we can show compassion, we can show kindness, we can show empathy. And Jesus walks up and touches the beer. I had to look that word up because I'm not familiar with it, uh, but it's the framework that supports the coffin. And the procession stops. You just imagine it. It's awkward. It's that funeral procession with this thing being carried with the, the arms out and people in front and people behind and they're walking along. And Jesus goes up and touches it. You could just imagine the scene. It's dead quiet. Everybody stops. Everybody's looking. And Jesus issues this really simple command. Young man, I say to you, I'll tell you, get up. How ridiculous. Young man, get up. But he's dead. No, he isn't. Here he comes. And he gets up and he, he immediately starts speaking. Luke always has little signs of, 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 kind of people being alive, indicators that they're really alive. In this case, is that he starts speaking. And the people use this phrase, which is rich in meaning. See that verse 16? They were all filled with awe and praised God. And they say this, a great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Remember when Zechariah's tongue was loosed, he was struck dumb because he didn't believe the promise he was given. But when John, his son, is born, he starts praising God. And he says in chapter 1 of Luke, verse 68, again a couple of pages back, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. And that's a very similar phrase to the one here. It's a real Old Testament idea of God coming down to visit his people in saving power. That's the idea that the people are expressing here. There's a prophet, God speaking. There's a saviour. God's come. God's come to visit us. He's come to visit us. He's arrived. The saviour's here. What Zechariah anticipates has actually happened. And really, they're going to have some fun now. They praise God, verse 16. There's this funeral procession. becomes something of a, you know, like on a town day or something, you have kind of floats and you, you kind of parade through the town and you celebrate. Well, it was going to become like that, wasn't it? You know, you've you got this beer and you've got all these people who are uh, beer. Is that how you say beer? I presume it is. Anyway, and you, uh, you're now not carrying a dead boy anymore. He's running alongside and chatting away. Because he's alive and you're celebrating God's salvation. Because that's what happens. And like the crowd, we're supposed to look at this and say, wow, God's come to visit his people. This is it. This is salvation. What Zechariah expects actually is going to happen. Can you see that? Can you see the compassion of Jesus? We're supposed to look at this story and say what compassion God has because he comes down to this world, his world that's rejected him. He comes to visit and he comes to save in glorious power. We recognize the compassion of Jesus as he looks out on this woman, a kind of a symbol of all that's wrong with this world as her son dies. People die all the time. Why do people die all the time? It's not biology. 
It's not some kind of cell process that goes on independent of God. No, people die all the time in all different circumstances because it is a sinful world. And Jesus has come to save people wrecked by the fall, affected by death. He's come to save all those who are spiritually dead, all those who will ultimately die physically because they're dead spiritually. It's the unnatural outcome of Adam's sin repeated in us, ultimate death and suffering. And what Jesus has come to do, and we see it as he does this miracle, Jesus has come to reverse that. Jesus hasn't come so we can go around resurrecting people at funerals, but Jesus has come to ultimately (coughs) deliver all his people from death. I don't know what cultural festivals there'll be in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know what we're celebrating, how we're singing, how we're gathering, all those things. But I tell you what, they will not be in funeral. Not one funeral in heaven. Did I say funeral? Not in heaven, not one funeral. Not one funeral. Might be loads of other things to celebrate. Nothing to mourn. And Luke wants us to see that as Jesus reaches out in mercy to this family. Salvation has come. And the question for us this morning is, do you recognise it? We've already asked, have you got the humility of the centurion? Have you got the confidence of the centurion? Well, here, do you see the compassion of Jesus for you to deliver you from ultimate death? Do you see he's got the compassion for you, but he's also got the power to do that? And this miracle prompts your faith to say, this is the saviour who's come to visit us. Only the gospel brings comfort. Only the gospel brings comfort in the present. Only the gospel brings hope for the future. Salvation only comes from God. It doesn't come from politics. It doesn't come from religion. It doesn't come from power. It doesn't come from solidarity. It doesn't come from love. It doesn't come from empathy. It only comes from Jesus. It only comes from Jesus. And we need to recognise that this morning and put our faith in him. And we need to recognise that this morning and hold out the hope of eternal life to a sick and a grieving world 